Okay. Good morning or good evening. Jeez. All right. It is seven o'clock on October 10th, 2022. And we are meeting at Woodland Elementary School. Thank you, Ms. Berboni, for hosting us this evening. And welcome to all of you in attendance. Thank you for being here. I hope that you are enjoying the start of this fall season. At this time, if you are able, will you please stand and join me in reciting the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the remote, which is one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Ms. McDonald, would you please read our land acknowledgement for this evening? On behalf of the board, and the Cherry Creek School District, I would like to acknowledge that this meeting is being held on the ancestral and unceded lands of the Cheyenne, Arapaho, Ute, and Ocheti Shakawi people who, stu who stewarded it for, for generations. The Ocheti Shakawi includes seven bands, so I would also like to recognize that over 40 additional tribal nations likely use this area for trade, ceremonies, and social gatherings. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, may I have a motion to approve the agenda? for the October 10th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. Yes, I move to approve the agenda for the October 10th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Thank you, may I have a roll call, please. Directors Allen. Aye. Bates. Aye. Egan. Aye. Garland. Aye. McDonald. Aye. Thank you, that motion carries. May I now have a motion to approve the minutes for the September 12th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. I move to approve the minutes for the September 12th, 2022 regular Board of Education meeting. Thank you, is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? May I have the roll call please? Director Allen, Aye. Bates? Aye. Egan? Aye. Garland? Aye. McDonald? Aye. Thank you. And finally, may I have a motion to approve the minutes of the October 3rd, 2022 Special Board of Education meeting? I move to approve minutes for the October 3rd, 2022 Special Board of Education meeting. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Thank you. May I have roll call, please? Oh, I'm sorry, is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Roll call, please. Directors Allen? Aye. Bates? Aye. Egan? Aye. Garland? Aye. McDonald? Aye. Thank you, that motion uh, also passes. It is at this time now that we have individual comments from our Board of Education. Director Egan, would you please start to the evening? Yes, thank you, Director Bates. Good evening, and thank you to Principal Teolan Burbani and the brand new Woodland Elementary School for hosting us here tonight. I think we can all agree that this is a beautiful space. And as always, thanks to our safety and security and technology teams for making these school visits possible. Our district is truly unique in holding our monthly board meetings in our schools. Today is Indigenous Peoples Day, and as such, we celebrate the people who first called this land home. We remember their struggles and tragedies they endured. We honor their place in and contributions to the shared story of America. Indigenous Peoples Day honors Native Americans through their resilience and contributions to American society throughout history even as they faced assimilation, discrimination, and genocide spanning generations. I had the pleasure of attending Steam of Palooza with my colleagues this past weekend. This event, seven years running, and a celebration of all things science, technology, engineering, art, and math, 
really got me thinking about growth mindset, one of our district's core values and the belief that we improve when we work hard, try new strategies and don't give up. Mistakes are not only okay, but also lead to progress if we learn from them. Mm -hmm. Growth mindset is the idea that the brain is a muscle that continues to grow with practice. This is in contrast to a fixed mindset, which is the belief that your intelligence and talents are fixed traits that cannot be improved over time. Students and adults with a growth mindset are more likely to try hard things and persevere through a difficult task. Stima Palooza embodies the core value of growth mindset. In the words of Albert Einstein, creativity is seeing what everyone else has seen and thinking what no one else thought. At our Cherokee Trail breakfast with the board last month, we heard from our feeder schools about the joy of being back in school on a predictable schedule we dearly missed over the past two years, two plus years. Community was the word I kept hearing from our amazing homecoming celebrations to our fun runs and visitors in our schools. Homecoming in particular is much more than just an opportunity to welcome back alumni to their high schools. In CCSD's six traditional high schools, it's a week-long community-wide celebration that involves past, present, and of course, future students through spirit bus visits. Get involved in your neighborhood schools and encourage your students to do the same. CCSD offers a myriad of sports and activities that allow students to have fun, make friends, and develop new skills. In fact, the research shows that students who are involved in school-sponsored activities and act athletics have better attendance and grades and fewer disciplinary issues. 75 to 80% of our middle school students and 60 to 75% of our high school students participate in one or more sports or activities in this district. Our neighborhood public schools are at the heart of our community in our diverse neighborhoods, and I am proud to represent them. I'd also like to mention that the Creek Community Covered, CCC, is back up and running to support the community. We appreciate the tremendous support the CCC received last year and look forward to another year in supporting students and families experiencing food insecurity. I attended the District Accountability Committee meeting last week, and tonight you'll hear a special report from Ms. Sarah Grobel and Mr. Norm Alerta and their teams on curriculum, professional development, and RAISE. This is a tremendous amount of work, and we thank Ms. Grobel and Mr. Alerta for their continued efforts in interpreting the district's data in response to one of our stated board goals of assessment supported by metrics and data. I was pleased to attend the Colorado School Finance Project's second annual conference, Investment in Action, last month. There was so much good information here about the financial landscape and forecast public education funding in Colorado. The Region 5 Colorado Association of School Boards meeting also provided an overview of upcoming issues of interest. Please continue to enjoy our beautiful fall weather and your fall break. This concludes my comments. Thank you, Ms. Egan. Uh, Ms. Garland. Thank you, Mrs. Bates. Good evening. Congratulations to the, Wood, the Woodland community and Mrs. Bermany for being the newest member of our district, and thank you for hosting us. Parents, families, and students gathered at East Ridge Community Elementary School on September 26th to celebrate the third year of the Indigenous Parent Community. I'm sorry, the Indigenous Parent Action Committee. The event included games, a maize food truck, food from Tokabi, and educational booths. CCSD alums and current CU Boulder students, Alexander Begay and Alfredo Bitsoy, staffed a, staffed a table to help students and families research colleges and scholarship opportunities for indigenous students. The Stronghold Society provided an art and skateboard design booth. This organization led by Walt Poirier works to create skateboard, skateboard parks and reservation communities across the Midwest. The event also included a table with free resources and for students and families, which included fiction and nonfiction reading materials, educational work and edu educational workbooks, to name a few. Layla DePaolo, a freshman at Grandview, attended the event and said that that the building community is an important part of the Native experience. 
DePaulo is the student representative for IPAC for the 2022-23 school year. My mom is White Mountain Apache, and it's important to know where you come from, DePaulo said. I am that I am unique, and I can celebrate with our cultures, cultures dances and seeing the community come together. Donna Christian, who's the current treasurer and the inaugural chair of IPAC, also emphasized the importance of building community for indigenous people. Events like this one are so important for awareness and creating connections, Chris John said. For indigenous people, one of our top values is to make, rel make relatives in this lifetime. Also, our families need to be familiar with support systems offered in the district. This happens most often by connecting through, through story and food. The most important part of connecting CCSD and indigenous families is that our students and families are seen as contemporary living beings that are part of this community. This is the second year for this event. IPAC is also in its second year of providing resources to teachers and students. They also host several cultural events and lectures throughout the Denver metro area, which include a drum making class, as well as the indigenous graduation in the spring. IPAC is compri comprised of parents with students in the Cherry Creek School District, and it's a federally funded program to support students and families. The Indigenous Parent Action Community was created one year ago to provide support and amplify the voices of the Indigenous members of this, of this, of this district. The Cherry Creek School District is, is home to more than 300 students and families who identify as Central, North, or South American Indian or Alaskan Native. There are more than 190 Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander families and more than 4,000 students who identify as multi-race and one of the above groups. The next IPAC meeting is November 3rd from 6 to 7.30 p.m. Please check our website for details. Several of my colleagues and I attended the Arapahoe County Early Childhood Meeting. The event recognized and celebrated the champions of preschool and early childhood education. Elected officials and civil servants who helped to increase the availability of preschool and families also spoke briefly. On November 1st, I attended the Mental Health and Wellness Summit held at Rising Star Missionary Baptist Church and organized by the Faith to Be Healthy Ministry and the NAACP. There were sessions presented on mental health and nutrition. I was able to share with, with the 75 or so attendees about the services offered within our district, which included trained nurse in every building, our 321 mental health service model, community health centers, social workers, advisory periods, sources of strength, and our mental health facility that will be open opening soon. Some of the attendees were able to converse and schedule mental health, converse and schedule with mental health providers learn about stress management, given nutrition information on and area health and area health clinics, and community fitness programs, books, and healthy snacks. The Cherry Creek School District is committed to honoring our heroes, the active, active service members and veterans who sacrificed to ensure our freedom, our happiness, and our safety. Oh, that's a terrible sentence. <laughs> this event hosted, hosted has been happening for 13 years. What started out as a handful of honorees has grown to over 250 veteran and active duty honorees. Attendees receive hats, t-shirts, and swag bags filled with goodies. Brigadier General Bren Rogers spoke, to the, spoke at the event and shared the benefits and advantages of being in the military and shared the need for more recruits. Los, Los Dos Patrios donated food for all our guests. Participants were able to interact with a variety of exhibits, including a Black Hawk helicopter, the Honor Bell, the Army National Guard gaming trailer, and veterans presented the POW MIA table. And this year, there was a new presentation done by students. They presented a table to honor military children. Symbols on the table represented parents who serve, students have to having to relocate and make new friends, in addition to other struggles faced by military students. Following the celebration, Grandview versus Overland team kick, uh, topped off the event. Happy 40th anniversary to Meadow Point Elementary. Their celebration featured past principals and staff, old photos, yearbooks, and tours. The community enjoyed the student choir, which, which sang the Meadow Point spirit song. However, this year's fifth graders worked really hard to compose, learn, and sing a new spirit song. And thanks to a generous and kind donation, students at the Cherry Creek Innovation Campus will be able to learn on the Black, Ho Black Hawk helicopter donated by United Roto Craft. This helicopter will allow students to take, to take classroom theory and apply it to real world aircraft systems and construction. This includes learning about aircraft landing gear, fuel systems, ice and rain protection, and aircraft structures. Students at the CCIC benefit when our community can come together for partnerships like these. The foundation also supports
supported students learning by being a sponsor of this week's STEM Palooza, where students challenge themselves to design, create, and learn about careers in STEM. That concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Garland. <clears throat> Ms. McDonald. Thank you, Mrs. Bates. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for being here, and thank you to our principal, and for and thank you for your hospitality on this evening. It's truly a pleasure to be here tonight for the first Board of Education meeting held at Woodland Elementary School. From the opening up until now, I'm sure it has been an exciting time. Thank you, Woodland Bears. Be bold, be brave, be brilliant. Be Bears. <laughs> Every year, World Mental Health Day is observed on October 10th globally. This day is celebrated to raise awareness about mental health, its significance to talk about mental health, its significance and important. World Mental Health Day is an opportunity to talk about mental health. The theme for this year is make mental health and well-being for all a global priority. Often the topic of mental health is taboo in communities of people of color. From the time of slavery until now, many factors have come into play to prevent people of color from getting the help they need. However, if awareness can move the stigma, hopefully that will help people of color access services and seek treatment when needed. It is also a known factor that youth mental health needs have risen in the, tremendously in the last few years. Nevertheless, it is reassuring to know that Cherry Creek School District has a wide range of programs to support our students and their families. It is equally important to recognize the many resources and supports are, that are available to our employees as well. So I would like to take this opportunity to thank our mental health supports, our nurses, counselors, district supports, as well as our Department of Equity, Culture and Community Engagement and our Suicide Prevention Task Force. Thank you, Mr. Steve Nerdevel, Director of Mental Health, for assuring the well-being of our students is a priority in Cherry Creek School District. And I too, like Mrs. Garland, attended the Mental Health Summit at Rising Star on um, this past week, a week before last. And also on Saturday, September 24th, I too, like Mrs. Garland, attended the IPAC. So I will move on. <laughs> I also was privileged to be a part of the OFS and the ES. ESC staff T-Gate cookout. It was great to meet and greet the staff from a different, different perspective, from those that work in the departments, those departments on a daily basis. Mr. Thomas Ross and committee put together a fun lunchtime event. Everyone wore their favorite spirit wear, home team shirt, hobby or passion shirt. There was also a very special guest in attendance at that um, luncheon, it was Riley, our therapy dog, and he stole the show. Lastly, recently, 84 STEM teachers recognized, were recognized. These are teachers who get, go above and beyond to support students in STEM classrooms. Three of the chosen, three of, three of the 85 were chosen from Colorado. And among the three chosen from Colorado was Mr. John Wiley from the Challenge School. This is Mr. R Mr. Riley's second year being recognized by the Society of Science for Science. Mr. W Wiley said that his goal is to teach his students how to think like scientists. He does this by designing experiments, conducting experiments, then constructing explanations about the world, how the world works as a scientist would. In addition to being recognized, he will, see, will receive a $3,000 stipend to help students in scientific research. 
Mr. Wiley often purchases supplies out of his own pocket, so this will help out a great deal. Purchasing supplies is just one of the many things that this money will help him with. Mr. Wiley also recruits mentor students from under, underrepresented communities and get them, he gets them to participate in science fair and competitions. Mentors present their students with research opportunities and help them enter projects into science fairs, making STEM career pathways more welcoming and inclusive. Again, congratulations to Mr. John Wiley. I also recognize that this month is National Hispanic Heritage Month, which began on September 15th and ends on October 15th. This is a time to celebrate the histories, cultures, and contributions of American citizens whose ancestors came from Spain, Mexico, the Caribbean, and Central and South America. And also don't forget, October is Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Please remember to get your mammograms. I am grateful to say tonight that I have, I have been cancer-free for six years. Thank you, and thank you, Mrs. Bates. Thank you, Ms. McDonald. Director Allen. <laughs> Good evening. Thank you to Principal Berboni and the Woodland Elementary School community for hosting tonight's meeting. And thank you to our security, IT, and setup teams for all of your behind the scenes work in preparing for our meeting. The Cherry Creek School District's central mission is to inspire every student to think, to learn, to achieve, to care. And in Cherry Creek, we lead with five core values identified by our community. Equity, relationships, growth mindset, whole well-being, and engagement. Our core values clearly define how everyone will work together to achieve our mission and carry out our vision. Core values are not aspirations and they are not self-congratulatory. They are practical. In Cherry Creek, we are dedicated to excellence. Excellence and our core value of equity are not mutually exclusive. Instead, inclusive excellence, ensuring each student has the opportunity to thrive can only be achieved through a foundation of equity. A retired teacher describes her commitment to her students in this way. To be successful, students must feel loved, supported, and challenged. To me, this is equity. And to me, this simple belief is at the heart of our commitment to excellence. I recently asked Principal Berboni how our core values are operationalized at Woodland Elementary School. She shared with me Woodland Elementary's equity promise. Part of it states, all students feel secure in their identity, knowledge, and abilities because we know and leverage student assets. All students have access and opportunity because we will dismantle barriers and create rigorous learning experiences. All students will know they belong because we care and are invested in them as individuals. We are trusted to make decisions to ensure instructional excellence for all. Woodland's equity promise is one way in which our core values are turned into action. I also recently visited Falcon Creek Middle School and witnessed our, our, our core values at work. I was struck by how many students approached Principal Kibbe with stories and information about what was going on in their lives. Principal Kibbe knew each of her kids, their names and their stories. She also shared with me all of the new after-school activities Falcon Creek has created and the popularity of these new groups. She stressed the importance of creating spaces for each student to foster a sense of belonging. These are some of the ways Principal Kibbe is operationing, operationalizing our core, core values. And the results are evident. As I visited classrooms, I saw students engaging with their teachers and the materials, and I saw teachers committed to the success of their students. I also attended the September meeting of our district level parents group, Parents for Academically Successful Students, or PASS. 
Parents in attendance were asked to review and comment on the Cherry Creek School District local literacy plan. Working in partnership with parents, particularly parents of color whose voices have too often been ignored and invisible. Asking for their voices and their feedback is a way in which we are making our core value or core values come to life. Since October, October is Dyslexia Awareness Month, I take the opportunity to address what dyslexia is and the importance of making reading accessible to all of our students, including those with dyslexia and other learning disabilities and differences. In my view, teaching our children how to read and write is one way in which we put our core value of equity into action. The Colorado Department of Education provides this definition of dyslexia. Dyslexia is a specific learning disability that is neurobiological in origin. It is characterized by difficulties with accurate and or fluent word recognition and by poor spelling and decoding abilities. These difficulties typically result from a deficit of the phonological component of language that is often unexpected in relation to other cognitive abilities and the provision of effective classroom, classroom instruction. Secondary consequences may include problems in reading comprehension and reduced reading experience that can impede growth of vocabulary and background knowledge. Dyslexia affects up to 20% of the population and represents 80 to 90% of all those with learning disabilities. It is the most common of all neurocognitive disorders. The Colorado Department of Education's website shows that 95% of students, regardless of their background, are capable of reading, of, of, are capable of learning to read through a structured literacy curriculum, which provides explicit, systemic, or systematic, and sequential instruction and foundational skills. Simply stated, a structured reading curriculum expands access to reading to reach so many of our students who would otherwise may have, may have slipped through the cracks. There are many real life detrimental consequences, consequences to illiteracy. According to Project Literacy, 43% of adults living in poverty have low literacy levels. The US Department of Justice reports 70% of incarcerated adults are unable to read above the fourth grade level. Helping our students find their pathway of purpose begins with teaching them how to read and write. Learning to read is one of the most powerful tools a student can have in their lifetime. In our district, beginning with universal instruction and all the way through our tier three support, we are creating greater access to literacy. We are do doing so through our district-wide structured-based literacy curriculum through the development and implementation of the Cherry Creek School District Comprehensive Local Liter Literacy Plan and through our commitments to our values of equity, engagement, growth mindset, and building relationships. Providing all of our students, no matter their race, gender, socioeconomic status, nationality, her heritage, and learning differences, with the opportunity to read is one way our core values are put into practice and fulfill our dedication to excellence. Literacy frees our children to learn and gives our students the basic building blocks needed to pursue their pathway of purpose. As Frederick Douglass said, once you learn to read, you will be forever free. Thank you. Thank you, Director Allen. Good evening once again, and thank you to Principal Barboni and her amazing team for hosting us this evening. And as always, thank you to our setup team and IT department for getting us ready to be out in, the, out in the community. We appreciate the opportunity to have these meetings in different feeding area, feeder areas throughout the district. It is always an honor to have our meeting in the newest school. Ms. Berboni and her cohort did an amazing job getting this school ready with so many innovative ideas for our students. This past Saturday, the local community was invited to a fun in flannel event. Yard games and tours of the building were offered. Many members of the community, even those without children in the school, came out to enjoy this event. This event was a great success. The prior Thursday, Cherokee Trail High School hosted the local feeder area to their weekly football game. To enjoy, I enjoyed watching the excitement on the students' faces as they approached the stadium, greeted by their principals and some of their school mascots. Community engagement is one of our core values. These two events were certainly a testament to this. 
These young children are learning the value of being involved at an early age. This type of activity will help them feel included as they move through the various levels of CCSD. It is also an opportunity for their, for their parents and caregivers to meet others in our community and for our local community members to see the commitment our schools have to engage the local communities. Last week, Eagle Crest High School was named as a Special Olympics Unified Champion School. They are one of only 150 schools in the nation awarded this honor. Eagle Crest has demonstrated a commitment to inclusion by meeting 10 standards of excellence. Way to go, Eagle Crest. And speaking of inclusion, Fox Ridge Middle School hosted the first ever unified soccer event with six schools participating. Peer buddies played alongside the athletes. Cherokee Trail High School soccer players served as referees and cheerleaders were on the sidelines cheering on the athletes. Most impressive was the entire student body of Fox Ridge Middle School packing the stands to cheer on the athletes. A student told me that this was the most people he had ever seen in the stands and was amazed at how loud the cheers were. The students held handmade signs in support of every school that was participating. The students were excited to present those handmade signs to each of the teams at the end of the event. A special thank you goes out to Fox Ridge PE teacher, Ms. Casey Brown, for the vision she brought to district leadership and for executing it excellently. The support she received is also worth mentioning. Thank you to all of the schools and staff that helped make this happen. And thank you to Special Olympics Colorado for providing lunch for all participants. Now, all of you middle school unified PE teachers, who will host the next event and what will the event be? Casey has set the bar high. For those interested, the next SEAC meeting is this Thursday, October 13th at the Fremont Building. October is National Principals Month. Studies show that principal leadership is second only to strong instruction when it comes to impacting students' achievement. Please join us in celebrating the hard work and dedication of principals in CCSD. Thank you to all of our uh, principals. And that concludes my comments for the evening. So at this time, we are thrilled that we have students speaking tonight. We love to hear our student voice since students are why we are all here. Will Victoria from Woodland Elementary please approach the microphone? Hi, my name is Victoria Thomason. I am in fifth grade and I go to Woodland Elementary School. Thank you for having me at the Board of Education meeting tonight. I am honored to speak to you. Our mission at Woodland is to be bold, be brave, be brilliant, and bounce, be a bear. We have lots of growth mindset. We practice a positive mindset, a patient mindset, and an open and new stuff mindset. Another part of the growth mindset is bouncing back and every student at Woodland is resilient and can bounce. Our teachers also help us embrace the word yet. That's a big word for us because it teaches us that we haven't learned this yet, that we're probably gonna learn this soon. For example, say we're on a pretest, our test to see what we didn't know before our unit starts, and we didn't know an answer. We could write IDKY, which means I don't know yet. That would show that we don't know this yet, that we're gonna learn it. We have to be brave to admit there are things we don't know yet. Our school makes sure that everyone has a sense of belonging. We also make sure that no one is left out. This is our brilliance. Teachers make a big point about how we include everyone. We accept people for who they are, and we show all peers love by giving compliments and making people smile, explaining something to someone when they don't get it, helping someone when they're sad or being left out, or if they have no one to play with, and more. The students at Woodland already have a strong bond with each other. Not only do teachers and students have a great bond, the community does too. Woodland does after-school activities such as choir, art, PE, student council, news, and more. This helps us meet new people and make our circle bigger. 
Woodland also gives kids opportunities. Like a few weekends ago, I got to be a tour guide and show the community around our beautiful school. Teachers show engagement by having kids learn in different ways. Teachers let us do work independently instead of them telling us what to do. Students are engaged because the work is challenging and interesting. As students are bold and show active listening, they also use time to ask questions. So teachers can make sure we know it makes sense. Teachers trust us to do stuff independently, and that can show what we've learned over the lesson in different ways and seek to understand what we don't know. I am proud to be a, a leader at Woodland and in this district. Thank you for listening and for all you do for us. And remember to be bold, be brave, be brilliant, and bounce. Be a bear. Thank you. Thank you, Victoria. Great job, especially because you're the first one tonight. I know you were nervous. <laughs> so um, I know Ms. Bourbonne has done a lot for your school here. Um, so what are you ready to do when you leave this school? Where are you? Um, I'm ready to like go into middle school and have different classes and have different teachers and have different points of learning. That's awesome. Are you ready to take your leadership with you? What'd you say? Are you ready to take your leadership skills that you learned here with you? Yes. Good. Good. We need lots of leaders in our schools. So good for you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Okay, now could we have um, Reagan from Fox Ridge, please? Hi, I'm Reagan Rose Merrick, and I'm an eighth grade student at Fox Ridge Middle School. I've been here since sixth grade. Fox Ridge almost has a second home feeling to it. I'm involved in drama club and the school theater productions. I started to participate in theater programs at the beginning of my seventh grade year. What really drove me to join was the environment I heard I had. There wasn't anything negative coming from the other students who were previously involved. We play games that engage us in the topics and also build relationships. We often work with people that we don't know all that well, and have the same interests as we do. It helped by extending my socialization skills, especially coming out of COVID. Another thing I've done that has allowed me to feel at home at Fox Ridge was joining the AVID program in sixth grade. Every year, I have continued to come back to it. Everyone who is involved makes sure that it is more than just a class, it's a family. We start off every day by answering an attendance question and ensures that everyone's voice that will be heard that day. I appreciate the amounts of notes that we are required to take. I feel so much more prepared before any big tests or quiz. It really lowered my stress levels when I had a definite study tool. Finally, my teachers here have all been understanding and supportive. We have flexible ways of learning that adapt based on the student. They are able to make other plans depending on specific styles of learning of each kid. Overall, everyone comes together to help make this school Fox Ridge. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan. I was um, I was lucky to be at your school the other day and um, at the soccer event, and I was so impressed with the spirit that um, Fox Ridge showed and the kindness that all of the students there showed to all of the participants in the event. So um, I can see that that is big in your school as well. So I appreciate that. Um, so you are in AVID now. Yes. So do you plan to continue on av in AVID when you're in high school? I actually do continue to planning. I actually do continue to continue. <laughs> I do plan on continuing AVID in high school. <laughs> Good job. I think it's, um, that was a great program for students to keep. It helps keep mm -hmm. you, um, does it help keep you organized and? Oh, ready? yes. Yes. I am so much more organized in the beginning of my sixth grade year. You can definitely see a fine line on where I was in the beginning of sixth grade and where I am now. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. I see you brought some of your teachers with you today, too. Uh -huh. I, I noticed that. Um, so do you have a couple of teachers that you know that are those people that you go to if you have... Um, a problem or something in your life or your, your personal life or school? You yeah, have a I, do that have, you can... I do have certain teachers that I go to. The, the avid teacher being one of them. 
Great. Mm -hmm. Great. Because we want to see that for all students. So encourage your friends to make sure they all have somebody that they can go to. Thank you. All right. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you. And now Chris from Cherokee Trail High School. Cool. Uh, hello, everyone. I guess to start, hi there. My name is Chris Sun, and it's unique because it starts with a K. My school story actually begins a little before the first day of school. Um, going into high school, I actually had a choice between another district high school, Cherokee Trail, and a school outside of the district. Seeing as how I'm now representing CT, I think you can figure out which one I chose. Nevertheless, the point isn't that one school was better than the others, but rather to highlight that, like my name, my high school experience has been unique due to my engagement during my time at Cherokee Trail. Once I arrived at CT, I jumped into every activity that I could, and I mean uh, everything. I'm currently first chair of Cherokee Trails Chamber Orchestra, a captain of speech and debate, a member of half a dozen clubs, and just two days ago, I was at CU Boulder for a model United Nations competition. In other words, I I'm a nerd. Um, <laughs> but going into more activities only furthered my engagement with Cherokee Trail. This engagement became especially prevalent with the introduction of the global health crisis we now call the pandemic. While this impacted every school and every nation on earth, Cherokee Trail's speech and debate was hit particularly hard. An activity based entirely on social interaction now forced into a virtual environment. The extreme conditions that we were now in forced me to adapt a growth mindset to sort of power through. And so as a Captain, a few others, and I took the charge to keep Cherokee Trail speech alive, working on Saturdays to run tournaments and to ensure that we just kept pushing forward. In the end, this boosted my engagement to my school and also helped foster equity in relationships among my peers and adults, both at CT and at other schools across the state. After all, everyone was forced to go through the same pandemic and struggled with the same well-being struggles as I did. But CT speech did push through. As this example demonstrates, all the other core values inadvertently fall under engagement through either self-engagement or engagement with others. And although the specifics are unique to each individual, it is not unique for students in the Cherry Creek School District to have these opportunities to learn and to grow. In the end, this school has been nothing but amazing. And as a graduating senior, I can say that there has never been a day in which I've regretted choosing Cherokee Trail. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, with a K. <laughs> um, I have a son whose middle name is Christopher with a K and an F. <laughs> so he's really a weird name. So <laughs> anyway, thank you. And I have nerds at my house as well. So um, That's great to hear. Yeah, and they went to CT. So, they <laughs> so do you remember um, when you were picking, when you were choosing what high school you went to, what was it about Cherokee Trail that made you pick CT. That's a really good question. Um, it was a lot of circumstance, a lot of random things. Um, Cherokee Trail is one of the f few schools in the district to have um, the IB program, mm -hmm. um, which was a really big factor. Um, going into it, I heard some really great things about the teachers and about the orchestra program, which mm -hmm. really kind of swayed me to stay in the district and CT seemed the best balance out of everything. Great. It's a good school. It it's is. a good choice. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> we like to think it was a good choice for you. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. Um, so um, again, I'm going to ask you the same question about um, having a couple of adults in the building that you know that you can go to as well. Oh, Do you have what? a couple of trusted adults that you can go to? Yes. Yeah. One hundred percent. I have not met a single student. Uh, sorry, uh, I've been lucky to 
have not met a single teacher that I could not have gone to th for my problems. And uh, just being willing to talk with your students and kind of go through things, being open and available uh, really makes a difference. And um, I've every single teacher I've had has done that. So that's great. Right. Thank you. So one other question for you. Do you have plans for next year? Ye what are uh, you going to do after high school? <laughs> that's another good question. I. Uh, I have a college application due in six days, and I need to get that done. Um, <laughs> Only one? Uh, one so far, and then give it another two weeks, and it'll be a lot more. Um, but yeah, no, um, I plan on majoring in biological sciences, um, and we will figure out where in a little bit. Okay. All right. Well, thank you again for being here tonight. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Okay, Matt. Mr. Smith, after that, I just wanted to comment. Um, I just wrote on my notes, um, Christopher Sun for 2048. You can send me your link to donate to your campaign. <laughs> And now we have um, Mr. Smith's most dreaded time of the evening yes. when he follows the students. So, <laughs> Mr. Thank you, Ms. Smith. Bates. So I just want to start. Victoria, thank you so much. You are out absolutely bold, brilliant, and most importantly, brave. Um, thank you for being a tour guide, but most importantly, thank you for making all the students here feel included. That's so important, and I appreciate that you like it. Who couldn't like this beautiful place, right? Reagan, thank you. Thanks for being engaged. Thanks for all the different things you do. I'm excited that you have some interest. I'm excited that you're pushing forth into AVID. That's wonderful. And you know what I'm most thankful for? The conversation that you shared with us that teachers at Fox Ridge actually know you and build their lessons around you, not just provide you content, but actually know who you are and try to build the lessons around you. So thank you. Chris, my first question is, when do you sleep? <laughs> Is it in between trying to get your college applications out there? Do you, do you sleep? <laughs> totally, because I don't know when you do. But thank you for keeping speech and debate going. Thank you for being resilient. Thank you for operationalizing those core values. It was so important, not only for you, but for your friends, your teammates. That's just huge. And then lastly, thank you for choosing CT. We're lucky to have you. And my friend, you're far from a nerd. You're brilliant, you're brave, and you're bold. <laughs> my comments for us are gonna be pretty brief this evening. Most of you already stole my stuff, so I don't wanna share that once again. One thing that I do want to share is a special recognition that the Cherry Creek School District is getting. So on November 4th, the Cherry Creek School District will be recognized as a district of distinction under chapter 35 of the Order of the Purple Heart for the partnerships that we have with our active servicemen and women and our veterans. I just wanna say thank you for all of our schools for recognizing our veterans, recognizing our active servicemen and women. It is extremely important because what I am sure of is their sacrifices made it our ability to be here tonight and the ability to have our students in school. So thank you, the Cherry Creek School District, for all that you do for our servicemen and women and our veterans, and we're excited about this distinction on November 4th. I'd like to welcome up Dr. Dominique Jones, Ms. Darla Thompson, our Assistant Superintendent, Sarah Grobel, and the rest of the team on our presentation tonight on curriculum and professional learning. Thank you, President Bates, members of the board, and Superintendent Smith. We're here tonight to give you updates on curriculum standards and professional learning. Last month, we were here and talking to you about the Comprehensive Aligned Assessment System. And last Friday, we had the opportunity to sit and talk to you about the school performance frameworks, as well as the district performance framework, and then our work to create both the district unified improvement plan or UIP, and then each school is um, going through the process over the next two weeks of turning in their school UIP. 
Tonight, we move closer to the classroom in our discussions. We hope that by the end of this evening, you'll have an opportunity to think about and understand the technical and adaptive work of um, the CDE curricular standard revision process, providing an update on the middle school math curricular review process that's happening this semester, understanding the role that professional learning plays in supporting our educators, and last but not least, understanding the collaboration with CCEA on the development of the RAISE program, which was formerly known as the STAR Mentor Program, and you'll get an opportunity to see how that has changed. Again, um, Superintendent Smith said some of the people that are joining us, we are going to start with Dr. Dominique Jones, um, but at this time, if we could also have um, Darla Quintana Thompson, um, your partners that are with you, as well as um, Ms. Casey Ellis, go ahead and you can sit right back there so we're ready to go and keep us moving. So thank you, Dr. Jones. All right. Good evening, board members. Thank you for having us here this evening. Tonight, I'm going to be joined with partners from the Office of Curriculum and Instruction, Dr. Melissa Peterson and Lois Vaughn. They are the partners of, of PK-12 Literacy. Oh, all right. As Sarah mentioned, we are going to spend our time focusing on what's happening related to CDE and how standards are revised at that level and how that's translating into work that we do inside of Cherry Creek schools. When we think about our work, we continue to operate in recognizing what is technical and what is adaptive. And when we think about the technical, we know that it's those are things that are easily able to be answered, that there might be a, um, a quick solution that might be in support of how we address that technical. But in the adaptive, an answer isn't so easily come to. A solution might not be so readily at the fingertips, and it requires us to be more flexible in our thinking, more creative in our approach. So when we think about what that translates for directly related to curriculum and instruction, at that technical level, we have the Colorado Department of Education, which identifies the state standards that we're able to utilize inside of all of our instruction. Those are on a timeline that CDE steps and sets and are revised every three years. And as we start to move down that thinking of technical versus adaptive, part of what then we do inside of Cherry Creek Schools is think about what curricular resources are going to align to those Colorado academic standards. And more adaptively, what does that mean for the ongoing professional learning that's focused on instructional practices and engaging in a curricular review process in order to identify what those resources are going to be? As I mentioned, CDE has the standards on a three-year rotation. Previously, it was every six years that they were revising, that they broke them down inside of three phases so that we're able to identify which content area standards are going to be revised and at what point. And this is simply another way to look at it. Where you see the yellow is where the revisions are happening at the CDE level, and where you see the green is where CCSD is then moving into implementation of those revised standards. In partnership with ECCE and Special Pops, we've developed a curricular review process that allows us to go through any content area curricular review that we engage a variety of educators inside of that process, and we have things that really ground that practice. We know there is no such thing as, as a perfect resource. And that part of that is the complex work that is embedded inside of helping all of our educators, it does not matter their title, continue to develop their culturally responsive mindset to implement the instructional practices inside of a classroom and leverage that instructional resource, that it is the educators in the space that are the ones that are responsive. A resource cannot be responsive, it can be relevant that the curriculum review process allows us to check for our instructional blind spots so that we are grounded in best practices and really thinking through how are we considering how all students are going to be connecting to and engaging through these resources with their learning process. And that as educators are utilizing the resource, that part of that is being a critical consumer of that resource in order to make sure that they're best supporting student needs. 
We are currently in the midst of a math curricular review process. The committee is composed of educators from across our system, various years of experience, different departments, SPED, GT, our English language services, that there is representation from across the system so that each feeder is represented. In our review, we are examining the current resource that we have in place, which is Big Ideas, as well as two other resources to make sure that we're looking at it through the lens of analyzing mathematical content development, where standards of mathematical practice live inside of those resources, that we are thinking about equity in terms of those resources. And when I say that, I mean, what does the activation of student learning look like? How is student choice embedded inside of those resources? And how are those resources, in addition to the practices of our educators, affirming and nurturing learner identities inside of math classrooms? That in part of that review, we're also looking at the assessments that are built inside of the resource, as well as the technology that students will grapple with. So in this review process, as I mentioned, there are three different resources that are being considered as we go through this process of gauging the pros and cons, going through a rubric that really grounds all of our work through those areas that I just mentioned, to be able to then make a recommendation for which resource we feel is going to be best aligned to the Colorado academic standards and those pieces of resources that we're gathering to be able to rec make a recommendation to move forward. and then pivoting to literacy. Cherry Creek Schools is one of the five districts that has been awarded the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant in the state of Colorado. The main focus of the grant is to improve literacy outcomes with a focus on providing curricular resources and professional learning grounded in evidence-based practices of the science of reading. While there are schools identified by the state that are receiving grant funding support, this is work that our entire system, PK-12, is engaging in related to literacy. Part of our work is to develop a literacy plan, which Director Allen spoke to. It's a Cherry Creek Literacy Plan, and that plan is made up of portions related to literacy leadership, universal and supplemental intervention instruction, assessment, mm -hmm. professional learning, database decision-making, and school leadership team. We are in a draft version of the literacy plan. And as Director Allen also mentioned, it we are in different spaces to be able to share that with the community and different stakeholders to be able to provide feedback. What that plan does then is to guide the work of Cherry Creek's development of strong literacy skills across all of our students in all of our schools, PK through 12, and that the grant actually speaks to birth through 12th grade. And so there are some things that are inside of the work that we do related to the grant that is outreach to our preschool programs that is in collaboration with our early childhood. The grant specifically focuses on underserved populations, which the feds have identified as students acquiring English, students with disabilities, students eligible for free or reduced lunch, students in foster care and migrant students. And we know in Cherry Creek Schools, part of our commitment is also in relation to students of color and making sure that as an underserved population that we are considering their needs as well. Through the funding of the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant, we've been able to implement the resources of things like foundations, which is that systematic explicit program that allows us to really target those foundational skills. Our kindergarten through third grade classrooms have been utilizing that resource um, full implementation in this school year. And we also have moved forward with a common literacy resource of into reading um, that our fourth and fifth grade will start moving into in the next coming year. In addition to this work related to the grant, we have what's been provided to us as a literacy evaluation tool. And it speaks to the same areas that I mentioned in the Cherry Creek Literacy Plan, where our administrators are already engaging and thinking about out their sites. Where are we in this moment? 
and to begin to identify what that means for our work moving forward. Very specifically with administrators right now, we're looking at literacy leadership and they're identifying one additional focus area, either of universal instruction, supplemental and intervention, or also assessment and database decision making. When we think about instruction for any content area, we know that we want to make sure that we're starting with a strong foundation of centralized universal instruction. You heard me speak to foundations. It is the foundational resource that we are using in our kindergarten through third grade classrooms. It was first introduced to our system last school year in 21-22, and we implemented it in our kindergarten through third grade classrooms. And this is the second year of implementation, and it is full implementation of that resource with tight expectations of that implementation. We also introduced Into Reading, which is our universal core resource, and it is one of the resources that is on CDE's state approved list. This year, kindergarten through second grade are implementing, we will start onboarding our third through fifth grade teachers around professional learning for implementing that resource beginning in December, so that by 23-24, we've reached full implementation. And we also have just finished getting all all of our teachers who needed to meet the READ Act designation requirement, 1,124 educators in our system have met that designation at this time. When we think about literacy intervention, we are talking about being responsive in the moment. So we know that we have these resources that are available that our educators can lean back on, whether that is for that more strategic support, which we refer to as tier two, or that more intensive support, which we refer to as tier three. And that strategic support for reteaching and foundational skill building can be utilized inside of foundations that in into reading when we think about how we might use that inside of an intervention that it again is about that strategic support for reteaching and skill building we also in our special populations team um, dave gudridge and tony pool and nori marsh have done a great deal of work in making sure that our kindergarten through second grade classroom teachers and interventionists have gone through the five-day pretty intensive training related to Orton Gillingham and what that supports is strategic and intensive support for foundational skills for our students and what we are introducing new this year and making some understanding of Wilson's reading system that it is an additional layer of intensive support for foundational word level skills and it is not a resource that is for every kid but as we think about the professional learning that is needed to help build the toolbox of our educators being able to go through this reading system training is just another tool for our educators to be able to utilize. Secondary universal literacy instruction. Again, we wanna make sure that we've got strong standards-based universal instruction. That standards should be where all of our educators are starting. In the school year, we are making some revisions to the secondary literacy assessment. Students have helped to generate ideas for prompts, things that they are interested in, have gathered resources to help us uh, support the shifting of that SLA prompt and work that's being done to create some alignment for that, that we're returning to a district table grading process, which has all been in our system for quite some time, but that it allows for the calibration to be in place for all of our 11th grade teachers and our students that are experiencing the student literacy assessment. All right. <laughs> And that there's professional learning to support that calibration and really thinking about that next layer of unpacking standards and expectations of proficiency, proficiency across the literacy bands. When we think about secondary literacy intervention, part of the work that we're doing in connection to the comprehensive literacy state development grant is working with our secondary administrators and someone else that they've identified as a literacy leader at their sites to engage in systems thinking work. We are partnering with the Water Center for Systems Thinking and doing some deep analysis of current systems and structures that are in place at each site related to literacy intervention. And in collaboration with our CCSD literacy consultants, um, going through 
there are five sessions that our educator, our administrators and educators are engaging in to be able to think through uh, what revisions they might want to make to the literacy intervention systems and structures that are currently in place. FastBridge is part of our comprehensive aligned assessment system, and there is data inside of that to help guide progress monitoring. So one, making sure that we understand what it is that we're looking at and making sense of as we are considering that data, and then to be able to, again, be responsive in the moment, whether that is drafting read plans and being really, really tight about what the support is going to look like to support students that have read plans, or thinking about, again, the systems and structures that exist at those sites to be able to be responsive to students with their needs. And that as part of the Comprehensive Literacy State Development Grant, the schools that are receiving funding related to that grant are beginning to implement Lexia Power Up, and it is a strategic and intensive support in word study, grammar, and comprehension, so that we're really able to advance reading proficiency towards grade level standards. really just to capture that it is a winding road and it is not a straight shot. And when we think about all of that adaptive work that goes into, we know our outcome is ultimately student growth and that students have what they need in order to be able to do what they need to do as they're on their pathway of purpose. So starting all the way at standards revision and best practices, the resources that are going to be aligned to those, the professional learning that's going to support the aligned adjustment of teaching and planning to support each student utilizing those resources, that professional learning communities are engaged to monitor and support student learning and how that translates into collaborative teams, that there's implementation of best practices and resources and we're relying on the resources that are available for educators to be able to continue to refine what that practice looks like and how it translates into the classroom and student learning, that when we are talking about intervention, that happens inside of the classroom, that it is timely and responsive to student needs. And there's many different data points and we're thinking through the triangulation of data to be able to do that so that we're able to get to student growth. And I'm gonna hand it over to my colleague. Ready? You are. <laughs> Good evening and thank you. Well, there's a lot of great work happening in the Office of Professional Learning. I really do appreciate this opportunity to showcase raise. So a little over two years ago, CCA President Casey Ellis and I pulled together a team to reimagine the ways that we can wrap around and support new teachers. Over the past year, we came together, partnership continued, collaboration continued, and the program has now expanded to wrap around and support all educators. And so I get the privilege of passing the mic over to Marie, the RAISE program partner in my office, and to Casey Ellis, CCA president, to speak a little bit more about RAISE and the Instructional Excellence RAISE coaches. Well, thanks for some of your time. Um, we really have been working hard over the last three years, I think, to um, put together a really great program in support of educators. And Casey and her team have been instrumental in the creation of the Instructional Excellence Raise Coach position. And so I'll have Casey speak more about those um, fine educators. So, uh, what we did, and, and Darla and I talked about this a few years ago, we re-envisioned what STAR could be, and STAR was basically just an induction program. And um, with Marie coming on board, we really looked at this being a three-year program. We looked at this supporting teachers their first year, their second year, and their third year. We also looked at this as something that could wrap around all teachers and coach all teachers to be better at their craft. So while working with Marie and two other partners, we are looking at how can these coaches in those buildings support all educators to make them better at their craft, help them be better in their craft, um, give them the opportunity to say, hey, I have this idea, I really wanna try this, can I bounce this off of you? And those are the things that we are doing. Um, Marie and I are talking 
almost daily this week, actually, <laughs> well, last week, um, on ideas and, and things that we have. So um, I'm thrilled that we are partnering on this. This continues the work that the STAR program started uh, 20 some odd years ago, 25 probably plus, um, but we're re-envisioning it and what it can do um, district wide and for every educator instead of just our brand new ones. And so you'll see listed on that slide a little bit more about our um, Instructional Excellence Raise coaches. They are a K-12 team. And so we have a coach who is either serving a building full-time or a coach who's serving two buildings. Um, so they are a full-time position, but they are um, working in two buildings that have been paired. They also work to support induction, which we'll talk about um, a little bit more in the next slide. Also some onboarding and mentoring, as Casey spoke about. Um, um, all of us can grow in our craft, especially if we have that growth mindset. And so the Instructional Excellence Raise coaches work to support that. Uh, the bulk of their position is job embedded professional learning. So anything from a coaching cycle, PLC support, all the way to working with um, some teachers who might be new to the district, but maybe not necessarily part of induction. And then also working with some of our educators who are maybe are a little bit more specific in the needs that they have. And so a large part of RAISE is educator induction. Induction is a process through CDE. It is state mandated, but district directed. And so we really like to think of induction as the process through which educators choose education as the career for them. But moreover, that Cherry Creek School District is the school district for them. And so the components of induction are that each teacher, each educator going through induction, they have an in-building mentor. Sometimes that is the instructional excellence raise coach. Sometimes the instructional ex excellence raise coach works with the other in-building mentors to build a smaller um, induction program of support in their building, building need dependent. Um, or they have a job like mentors. Some people have specific job needs. For example, our SSPs really benefit from having a job like mentor. Uh, they also engage in non-evaluative observations for over the course of their first year of induction. There are free learning opportunities. We are proud to say that before Thanksgiving break, there will be over 20 free learning opportunities for our educators going through induction. They're open to everybody, but um, they are really meant to serve uh, educators in the RAISE program, and that list is growing. We are currently uh, trying to find some rooms for workshops that people would like to have and um, lots of connection points. And so I think what you will hear as we talk about the RAISE program and our instructional excellence RAISE coaches is all five core values are really reflected in the work that this program does and that Casey and I get to do together. So I know this has felt like a ton of musical chairs, but you're seeing a lot of people here that are supporting our programming um, beyond just the directors that you normally have an opportunity to work with. So at this time, we'd like to thank you um, for the time that we had to spend to share that information. And we're open for any questions that you may have, and we'll just pass the mic to whoever might be the best person to answer. Hey, Ms. Egan, do you want to start? Sure. Thanks, Director Bates. Thank you, Ms. Grobel. I actually have some questions that I think are directed towards Dr. Jones. Oh, hi. <laughs> Could you talk a little bit more? You have a slide about 6 through 12 vertical alignment in reading or writing intervention. I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about how that works. I'm going to let Dr. Peterson speak to that. Okay. So Dr. Peterson is one of our um, English language arts partners. Okay. Good evening. So yes, that is not particular to intervention. It's to writing instruction overall. So we're working with the coordinators at the middle and the high school level to create a comprehensive scope and sequence for writing in our district so that the steps are aligned as they work from sixth grade up through 11th and 12th grade where they take their proficiency exams to graduate from high school. So right now the culminating writing piece of that is the secondary literacy assessment, which Dr. Jones talked about. 
So we're planning on having a common formative assessment for writing at each grade level, six through 12. So they're building the proficiency and getting that feedback every year so that students know where they're at and know the skills and have mastered them in order to be proficient and demonstrate that proficiency when they're ready to exit high school. Okay, great, thank you. So those of you who don't know me uh, over the last six weeks or so that we've seen seen this information, which we greatly appreciate. Thank you. It's I know it's so much work, but I keep kind of focusing on the consistency piece. And I know Ms. Grobel and Dr. Jones have heard this, but just if you could talk a little bit more about how that professional learning supports our educators. And I know that you've done some more thinking about that over the last couple months too so i'm just curious about where you are with that so i'm going to pass that actually both dr peterson and um, Ms. lois vaughn who is our other um, english language arts partner but again the, an opportunity for them to talk about our universal um, frameworks and the things that we're pushing out so for secondary, we're working on the table grading, which is a calibration process so that teachers are aligned on how they grade student work and acknowledge proficiency and then give students feedback if they're not yet proficient. And then they're trained on giving um, conferences with each student to provide that feedback and give them the opportunity to get to mastery in their writing pieces. So that's one piece of the professional development that every teacher will receive in 11th grade English. And then just today, and again on Thursday, we're offering professional development for um, middle school and high school teachers to kind of build the foundation of the science of reading because they are a part of the population that was not required to have the 45 hours of additional training and a lot of them went into this field not with the technical expectation of teaching reading but more along the lines of teaching reading and writing in terms of novels and response to literature and so we really supported them in building the foundation and what we're talking about when we say science of reading and evidence-based practices and then we walked them through sessions of being able to read the student data and interpret it um, presuming positive Positive and focusing on the skills that the students do have and the next steps they need to get to mastery on the ones that they don't. And then we had a group of teachers model a workshop model um, to demonstrate how within the actual English language arts block, not a separate intervention course, they can differentiate and provide interventions as classroom teachers by pulling small groups of students, by giving the content, sending students out to try it, and then pulling back students who are showing patterns of not understanding or needing more support with the work they're doing. So those are the two big pieces that we're working on this year. Great, and I think Lois you. can probably share some things from elementary too, if that's okay. Um, so as we saw on the slides that Dr. Jones presented, there are a lot of new curricular resources available in elementary K-5. So part of that is offering that high quality professional learning so our, or so our teachers can implement what they've learned in that 45 hours of training keeping in mind that with these new curricular resources, we're always starting with our standards and always focusing on that strong tier one, but knowing that when we hand teachers curricular resources, they also have to have the professional learning that goes along with it in order to have successful implementation. So that's what we're focusing on in elementary. Also for some intervention pieces, as Dr. Jones said, we're, um, we're getting ready to embark on some professional learning from Wilson Reading System, another way to meet the needs of some of our students in the district and just continuing that professional development so that we can offer that strong tier one universal instruction for all of our students. Great, thank you. So my last question is, I'm pivoting now to math. Just wondering if you could, I don't know who would like to address this, but if you could talk a little bit more about the middle school math curricular resources and then what we're learning from those and kind of where you're expecting so I'm going to have Dr. Jones take that. Our partner for mathematics isn't here tonight, but she can talk to us about the process and the really the why of um, why we're looking at that curricular resource right now. So when we look at our math data over the last, let's say, five to six years, and because the resource that we are currently using in our middle school math classrooms was chosen before the standards were revised, we are at a point where we have to go through a math curricular review process. And that does not mean that it's already been decided that we move away from the resource that's currently in place. But as 
I mentioned there are very specific areas that we're looking at. So big ideas is what we are currently using. There are two additional resources that we are considering. And as we go through this review process, and we've only had one session, our next session is actually this Wednesday coming, um, to be able to start to make sense of which one of the resources is going to be most aligned to the rubric that guides our curricular review process that is best aligned to the Colorado academic standards. And CDE has a list of what they call approved math resources. And that is where we started to pull from to even be able to engage in this conversation. So that's where we are in this moment. Um, when I have time with you again in November, I will be able to better tell you where we landed and the rationale for why that was the resource we're recommending to move forward with. Okay, great. And I appreciate your comment too that there, and I think it's important for everyone to realize that there is no perfect curricular resource out there for any subject matter. And I think that we need to be mindful of that. And so again, thank you. I appreciate you being here and I hope you have a good fall break. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Ms. Egan. How about Ms. Garland? Yes, I have a couple questions. Now, when you talked about the, um, you know, the six through 12 component of the, um, of the literacy issue, I guess, what will the parents get like a fast bridge sheet as well during conferences or what does that look like? Do you want Dr. Peterson to take that one? I, are you speaking specifically to literacy or math or both? Well, both. I mean, I guess when I saw that there's those intervention tools and the identification of them, are, will those be available at conferences for parents to see? So I want to make sure I'm clear on if you're speaking to fast bridge data or if you're speaking speaking to Lexia. So Lexia, I can speak to, and that, um, yes, it, it's a brand new resource. So even just the rollout for the schools that have the opportunity to engage with it this year, that there is a common parent message that we've already provided to leaders to be able to share. And that once reports start rolling in, that there, there are resources to be able to share with parents to be able to make sense, and that there's a home component as an intervention that they would be able to engage at home as well as at school. And then Dr. Jones, can you talk a little bit about triangulating data with parents so it's not just one data point, but multiple? Right. So then yes, FastBridge is another resource that we want to, you heard me mention triangulating data and we've heard Norm's team say that repeatedly. So the triangulation of FastBridge data, of classroom data, um, if Lexia is an option uh, as a resource that's being utilized in the site, that there's a triangulation of that data. Dr. Peterson was just saying, there might not be data outside out from Lexia before conferences. And that doesn't mean that that communication can't still happen with families um, once that data is available. And then um, my, I guess my second part of that question is, I guess when I, I know that K through three is the fundamental time to get kids reading. And when that doesn't happen, there's interventions. And so when I hear that six through 12, like we're still having interventions at that point, you're reading to learn. And so how is someone in six through 12 and still having literacy issues? I think that there could be a variety of reasons for that. Um, and one of the things that we've done in elementary specifically with bringing on foundations as an example, that it's systematic, that it's explicit, that it is aligned to evidence-based practice and science of reading that isn't a resource that's been in our system prior to last year. So for a variety of reasons for why students may or may not have gaps in their learning, we want to make sure that the resources that we have are going to be in support of those and uh, that are, to your point, our 6th through 12th teachers, I would actually even say our 4th through 12th grade teachers, didn't go to school to be teachers who teach children how to read. And so to make sure that we are supporting those educators with professional learning to be able to support those needs, any needs as they arise and be responsive in the moment and not wait until, oh goodness, we're at the end of semester one and all of these things have, have shown up. How are we being more responsive than that? Director and I know, um, because I know I've been asked this question, so why isn't that a reason? I know there's a variety of things, but why wouldn't a student be held back if they're lacking something as foundational as reading? There is a great deal of research about the harm 
that can be caused to children when they are held back. So it is not our go-to practice. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. And that is a lot of collaboration between the school team and the family to be able to make that decision. But that is never going to be the the first choice that we make. And that when we think about being responsive to any learner's needs, it doesn't matter what the cause of why we are in this moment, but that we are making sure that that child gets wrapped around and that their educators have what they need in order to be able to do that wraparound. And Director Garland, I also add that we take students, I mean, we're public education, and so we do have quite a few students that will start with us in kindergarten and end with us senior year, but we also have kids that come to us every single day of the year, as well as each school year. And so um, we have to make sure that we provide services all the time that meet kids where they are and provide the interventions that they need to be at the level that we expect our students to be. And then for the RAISE program, um, are there PLCs to help teachers integrate um, the technology piece, um, especially since we passed out laptops to every single student in our district? Marie, I think that's a great one for you to take. Uh, so. Oh, thank you. The uh, new teacher orientation that is held um, at the start of every school year, which is really a joint effort through every department throughout the district. That is where teachers new to the district, any educator new to the district will receive their um, Surface Pro. As part of that new teacher orientation, they will get a little bit of training in what that looks like um, and how to best use that to support student learning, including uh, My Cherry Creek where we house all of the apps that we are using for student learning. And what I will also say is as part of the onboarding and mentoring of the RAISE program, that is an area where we are continuing to grow. And so I am currently working with our digital, lear digital learning coordinator to put together some online onboarding modules so that educators can deepen their understanding of what you are talking about. How do I best support my students with the one-to-one -one technology, which has been such a gift to all of us, educator and student. And we really wanna make sure that we are utilizing all of those to the best of our ability. Um, and so m more of that is coming, more support in that area, but there is some um, already existing. And President Ellis, did you wanna add to that? Yeah, what I can tell you is that there are some technology coordinators out in the district that are well aware that teachers need that support. They are already putting some, um, what I would call uh, technology bites in place that they send out to their staff or, or work with them to help them uh, really use that technology that they have in their hands so that they're able to integrate some of the technology pieces with their students. And then in assessing um, whether or not students are meeting standards, and I guess I always wonder how, when you have things like spell check and things like spell check Grammarly that um, kind of does some of the work that we used to have to do by hand. Um, and then also just thinking about, you know, we used to do things with slide rulers, but we don't do that anymore. So what's the balance of like this sort of um, having this sort of uh, depth of knowledge versus having access to technology to be able to find the answer as well? So is that a Dr. Peterson or Dr. Jones? Well, I guess I just wonder like when we're assessing students, right? And so um, you don't have to do long division anymore because you can just use the calculator. And so um, I know we frown upon that, but like really who's doing that? Like if like if I'm, if I'm an engineering firm and I'm supposed to build a bridge, I'm not out there measuring with a 12 inch ruler, right? I have digital things in a computer. And so while you need to know those skills, are we testing the use of technology with the math knowledge, or are we still using slide ruler techniques? So I guess, I, do you understand what my question is, or is that, I know that's a lot. I'll take this one, because I used to be a math teacher. I, I will tell you, um, we do do calculator and non-calculator, so technology and non-technology curriculum. Um, the quick example I'll give you is a Zilwaukee Bridge in Michigan. We prepare our kids for any pathway, and then the kids are going to choose the pathway that fits for them. Zilwaukee Bridge, multi-million dollar issue because they had someone who rounded a square root of an answer. And so they, when the bridge came together, building from both sides, 
didn't connect. Right. And so I would tell you, we understand that our kids are going to go into a lot of different pathways. It's our job to make sure that they have the education they need to be successful in the pathway that they're in. And if they use that skill to the extent of their um, possibility, great. If it's one that they don't necessarily need and they can plug into a calculator and go, that's great too. But it's our job to make sure that they're prepared for any pathway. And that's really the charge from our superintendent. If I would just add on to that to say, there has to be a foundation of conceptual understanding first. So those tools might come in later. My daughter is learning how to drive right now, and she's like, well, you did it. Why can't I? Well, I have to understand why it works the way that it works first before I can start figuring out how am I going to bring in a calculator or why am I going to turn right when I'm not supposed to right here? We want to make sure that foundation is there. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Ms. McDonald? Thank you, and thank you for your presentation on tonight. Um, you did answer one of my questions, and that was uh, um, with the uh, equipping of the teachers, uh, what what on onboarding look like. So you did answer that. But I also would like to ask Dr. Jones if you could give me an example of what adaptive teaching looks like. So you heard Lois speak to always starting with standards first. Right, like that can be really technical, but the unpacking of what a standard is asking us to do, what that means for instruction, what that means for student learning, uh, my uh, my understanding as an educator of how the brain learns to read or how the brain learns math, all of those pieces coming together to funnel inside of planning. What does it mean to plan with all of those things as my foundation to then look at individual students in my classroom and go, what does that mean for you? So it's not about opening a curricular resource, be it bridges or big ideas or into reading and say, I'm going to go page by page. No, I, that's very technical. But the analysis of the standards, the understanding of how students learn, the bringing all of those pieces together to make it make sense for this kiddo and this kiddo and that kiddo in the ways that it makes sense for them, that is the adaptive work of teaching. Thank you. Okay, hey, thank you, um, Mrs. Allen. Thank you. Thank you everyone for the presentation. Um, my first question is probably for Dr. Jones, and then after that, anybody can answer. But as you were speaking, I heard you say a resource cannot be responsive, it can be relevant. Can you explain what that means? Much like what I just described to Mrs. McDonald, in that an educator is the one who has to make all of those decisions about how am I gonna bring that standard to life? What is my understanding of that standard? How am I going to take this resource of bridges and be a critical consumer of it in order to make sure that my students' needs are met? That is the responsiveness that happens inside of teaching that a resource cannot do. A resource is laid out in the way that the company designed it it might have lots of pretty bells and whistles. There might be some relevancy to standards, to being culturally relevant in terms of who's inside of the material, who's not inside of the material, um, what cultures are represented or not, and then what the educator has to do in order to be responsive to the pieces that are there and aren't there in order to bring it to life in the classroom. Thank you. And then one question, something that just keeps coming to mind as I listen to all of the demands we're putting on teachers to learn this new material um, and then to be able to teach it with fidelity. And I, I think, I'm not sure if it's a question or a comment, maybe I'll get to the question, but, um, and Dr. Jones and I had this conversation briefly about recognizing the humanity of teachers, inviting their input and making sure the programs that we're providing for them are actually responding to the, their requests. Is that is that all taken into consideration um, as just, you know, the demands on teachers just seem to be increasing every day? 
I think, can we start real quick with President Ellis on this one? She has been an ally, um, a collaborator. This has been a lot of work as things have started to roll out and we continue to be in compliance with Colorado Department of Ed. I think it's important that we've started with our union president and um, other members of the union to make sure that we together collaborate on what that looks like. Thank you. There, there has been a lot of collaboration with the union and kind of how this is rolling out, what is rolling out, when it is rolling out. Um, it is a lot on the educators um, and they are, uh, they're making it work um, as, as we move through. And I will tell you part of that is because of, of the coaches that are in the buildings as well, right? The coaches are helping them work through this and figure out uh, what the next steps are. Um, as an educator myself, any new curriculum, uh, middle school science curriculum, it is kind of like every three years, something changes. I had uh, dissections in eighth grade and then it moved to sixth grade and then it came back up to eighth grade. I mean, it's just what CD, CDE does. Um, you get used to that, right? Um, I will tell you when a new curriculum comes into play, it probably takes a good three years before you become really comfortable with it and really confident with it. Uh, you give the teachers this year to uh, investigate and uh, start to figure out what that curriculum is about. Next year, they're going to be even more comfortable with it. By the third year, they're going to feel pretty confident with it. Um, it just takes time. It's like anything else. It just takes time. And um, the teachers are, are doing it. This is, this is what we got into education for, right, is to educate kids. And they're doing at their absolute best with what they have in front of them um, and with the support of the coaches and with the support of the partners and uh, their administrators, they're making it work. Thank you. So I think when you spoke about humanity and teaching, I think you, we all know that there is no perfect resource, that we have to look at the resource as a curriculum, as a curriculum, as a curricular resource. And that's when our, our individuality, our uniqueness as a teacher comes in. We start with those standards. It is expected that we teach those Colorado academic standards and that our students progress towards mastery of those standards. However, we can't turn pages in a curricular resource. Most of the resources that we have are written for nationwide use, and we have to pare that down to what we know is best practice here in the state of Colorado. So thinking about offering educator uniqueness comes into the fact that I'm going to look at the students who are in front of me, and I'm going to use this as a resource, as a guide. I'm going to know what standards I need to teach, and I can ask, what does this resource offer me as a teacher, and how can I deliver that instruction to my students based on what my students need? So although we do have curricular resources that, you know, there's legisl legislation that says we have have to choose resources within an approved resource list, there's still that opportunity for us to start with our standards to provide that strong tier one instruction using those resources, but also thinking about the students in front of us and how we can best meet their needs. And then one more question um, about the um, our, our literacy, the state development grant, grant what is your goal or what are you hoping that we accomplish in our district through that grant? Just going to say, Dr. Jones, grab that mic. I think that's you. <laughs> I giggle because there are so many things inside of that grant. Um, when we think about the secondary level that we've gotten to a point where disciplinary literacy is very strong and that as Director Garland spoke to that there's a minimization of our six through 12 students that are in need of intervention support, that the instructional practice that's grounded in evidence-based practices continues to grow inside of our educators, that we have tighter systems of intervention structures in place inside of our six through 12 sites. That doesn't mean that they don't have them, but that we have a more consistent understanding across our system of what that means. That um, to Casey's point, we have all of these new elementary resources and that by the end of our time in this grant that we've gotten to a point where we're really comfortable. They're not new to us anymore. We've made them ours. We've done the digesting that we need to do. We've engaged in some rich planning to understand what it is that we need to get kids towards. Um, 
a spiraling curriculum, what does that mean and how does that impact my instruction? From a preschool standpoint, universal preschool is coming and through this grant, how are we making sure that those classrooms have all of the resources that they need, that the staff that is supporting those students in preschool have the professional learning that they need and that it's in alignment with what's happening in our kindergarten through fifth grade classrooms, that we continue to do outreach to our birth through three-year-olds families um, to engage them in family events and that through the Cherry Creek Literacy Plan, it continues to be an iterative document that's guiding our work so that it means it needs to be evolving, that there continues to be feedback on it. And as we make gains in relation to the literacy evaluation tool, we continue to think about that's where we are in this moment. What does that mean for next? That's a lot of goals. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. I didn't mean for it to be such a loaded question, but it is so important and I appreciate the um, all the hard work that's gone into all of these presentations and the thoughtfulness with what you're doing it. Thank you. Yep. All right. Well, since I am the last one, most of um, my questions have been um, answered already. But um, one thing I would like to comment on is um, at the secondary level where you um, are saying that you've asked the students for student-led prompts. I think that is so important for students to be able to write about what they actually are experiencing in life. So I appreciate that that's going to be part of this. And then, um, and then the other thing that I, I'd like to say is um, I appreciate the leadership. Um, leadership and CCEA working together, um, that we can all work together for what is best for our students. And so I appreciate that we have that here in Cherry Creek and that you've all taken this on together and um, making sure our kids have what they need. So I appreciate um, this whole presentation and everything that you do on a regular basis for our students. So thank you. Thank you. And I would tell you this is um, we try to simplify as much as we can, but you through your questions always find a way to show the complexity of the work that we do. So amazing performance improvement um, partners and directors. And then again, a great collaboration with CCA. So thank you for letting us be here this evening. Thank you. OK, it is at this point in our meeting that we make time for members of the audience to have who have completed the online public comment form prior to 12 noon today to address the Board of Education. In order for everyone to be heard, please limit your comments to a maximum of two minutes. A buzzer will sound at the end of your two minutes and the microphone and audio will automatically be muted. Each speaker may only speak once during public comment. Speaking time may not be shared between speakers. This is your opportunity to go on the record with the Board of with comments to this Board of Education only. In accordance with board policy, it is not a question and answer session. Please recognize that students attend most of these meetings. Any speaker whose statement or behaviors are unrelated to the business of the district appear threatening or unsafe or inappropriate for K-12 students may be interrupted or warned and their opportunity for further comment will be terminated. We are very interested in your feedback and will listen carefully. On behalf of the board, I want to thank you in advance for your comments and for taking the time to attend tonight's meeting. Mr. Koenig, would you please call the first group to line up? As I call your name, please line up in order behind the podium. I'll call five at a time. Maureen Welch, Barbara Niederhoff, Lori Gimmelstein, Michael Hancock, Shemaine Navarro. Oh, Ma'am, you can actually give it over here. Ma'am, he's got it. Thank you. And does the minutes read out on this or how does that work? Oh, I have to look up there. Okay. 
Can you start it at, at two, please? Oh, okay. All right, I want to thank the board and also give a shout out to um, all the teachers um, in the special education department, especially at Cherry Creek um, High School and the paras, as well as the bus drivers and the paraprofessionals and the aides on the bus. Um, my son in the ILC program at Creek greatly appreciates all their hard work. And first, I wanted to mention that um, Cherry Creek School District is in the first, first in almost everything, okay? But there's one thing that the, the board is actually dead last in, and that is digital accessibility of the board meetings. Um, I spoke last month about this, and I did some research in the six metro districts, and we are the only board, Cherry Creek School District, this board is the only board that does not live stream their meetings. That also means that the public cannot watch those meetings on demand. So that's a real issue, and I really want to bring it to the board's attention. Um, you had wonderful accolades um, last week and this week to the staff, but most of them are at home taking care of their families and grading papers. It would be wonderful for them to be able to tune into this meeting and listen Listen, um, and I just think it's a missed opportunity. We have a lot, a lot of morale problems in the school district, and it would be really wonderful for the board um, to be heard by the staff and the teachers. Um, I also think it's a bit of a travesty that uh, only able-bodied, privileged people like myself who are able to get here are the ones that are able to listen to the meetings and to speak to the board. So I really urge the board in the, the name of equity to really consider this. Um, thank you so much for your time. Hi, my name is Barbara Niederhoff. I'm a former student, parent, employee, still a resident. I'm also a former librarian. Last month, I came and shared aspects of suicide prevention, and I closed hoping our students will know they're not alone. We all know that kids in every generation feel pressure to give up their real selves and conform to imagined roles, a pressure that's even more intense on kids whose bodies may look different, kids whose minds may be wired differently, kids whose genes, chromosomes, hormone levels, and more may naturally have a different configuration for most of their classmates. Every one of them is wonderfully made as the individuals they are, and they're entitled to lives outside boundaries that only persist because that's what people like us and people around them are already used to. Uh, but back when I took health and cult biology classes, there were a lot of things you could say we didn't know yet. We keep learning, though, and when we know better, we do better. The school library can be a resource and refuge for all kids and a lifeline for those finding their place in a world still unsure about recognizing them. The library should be where they can learn how their bodies work, how their minds work, how to take good care of both. A place to learn the stories of people both familiar and unfamiliar. The librarian's role is to provide reliable, current, and age-appropriate material about a wide variety of people and topics. In high schools, where students on the cusp of adulthood may already be exploring the adult world on their own, they absolutely need access to real information beyond what they get from their friends and social media. They're entitled to the freedom to find out and the freedom to be themselves. The selection process should consider works as a whole and understanding the proper context of all their parts. Someone's life may be saved because they learned they're not alone. Thank you very much. Good evening. Um, I'd like to share with you a really fantastic opportunity. I'm a co-founder of both the Cherry Creek and Colorado Parent Advocacy Networks. Uh, and I wanted to share with you about an upcoming event that I'd love for you guys to save the date for. Um, Colorado Parent Advocacy Network is a nonprofit organization in which parents and stakeholders and teachers across the whole state of Colorado are purposefully working together to reestablish a rigorous, non-political, safe, and joyful educational experience for students through a culture of accountability for academic excellence, accessibility to school choice, partnerships with families, and curricular transparency. Tickets to our launch event will open up on October 26th, and all school boards across the state will be invited. Um, these tickets are complimentary, and I will definitely save you guys a seat. Um, you will be able to hear from our distinguished panel, including the daughter of the late uh, civil rights activist, Reverend A.D. King, and the niece of Dr. Martin Luther King, our mentor, Dr. Alveda King. 
I hope that you'll be able to join us. I also wanted to share with you that the Cherry Creek Parent Advocacy Network is a group of dedicated and concerned parents, teachers, and community. And we believe that Cherry Creek has failed to provide a safe and appropriate learning environment and has adopted divisive ideologies that are harming rather than helping our children. We ask you to return to your long-held dedication to excellence in offering a rigorous, non-political and equal academic education. I will be sharing a letter that we released on October 2nd with all of you to educate and inform the community about lowered academic standards and performance, the systemic issue of mishandling sex, sexual, physical assault and harassment cases, and the alarming curriculum and practices being used in this district. So I'd like to bring those up to you. Do I need somebody to do that for me? Hello, my name is Michael A. Hancock, not to be confused with uh, the other Michael Hancock that you might have heard of. Uh, we were disturbed to learn that the district administration and the Board of Education set a goal in February of 2019 as part of the district's systemic racial equity transformation program. It required all new to Cherry Creek School District education Aid educators attend the Pacific Education Group's diversity and courageous conversations, professional development training sessions, a curriculum that has been flagged by numerous civil rights organizations for promoting and emphasizing aggressive and divisive ideology. The, ide the ideology assumes that America was founded on the white supremacy and asserts that racism is at the heart of every disparity in society and our schools. It requires people to see themselves not as individuals, but as representatives of a group of oppressors and oppressed, all depending on the color of their skin. They teach such lessons as eighth grade language arts assignment at Infinity Middle School, asking students to identify why their favorite hobby is racist. For 12th graders at Smoky Hill High School, a class titled Math and Social Justice is offered the twist the statistics where students use the power of mathematics to explore social justice topics. And Overland High School English teacher literally forced students to respond to a video about the tragic story of Emmett Till by demanding they be enraged and repeatedly say the F word while declaring that he flipped his desk another class because his students were not enraged to his satisfaction. As parents, community members, and leaders, we encourage the school district to teach the complete and complicated truth about America, including its flaws and failures. Thank you, your time is up. Shemay Navarro, a sophomore parent. Did you know that in additional, addition to more than half of our kids not meeting basic expect, expectation academically, they also struggled to feel safe in their learning environments? Beginning in April of 2022, the public was made aware of the district's mishandling of multiple sexual, physical assaults and harassment cases. The students and parents came together across the district to convey their concerns and requests. The district evaluated their practices and policies um, to, to request that the district evaluate the practice and policies. Their outreach has been ignored. The district continues to employ a variety of practices that do not protect our children from harm. A district administrator was has also admitted that to using gender specific plans that instruct educators and staff to change the names and pronouns of any student that requests a change without the knowledge, approval, or consent of the child's guardian or parents. Kids are routinely asked unwelcome, offensive, and personal questions about their sexual orientation. Students have shared that they have experienced harassment and shaming for their gender, sexuality, and race. They have shared that they are pressured to change sexualities. Children who are white have shared that they feel ashamed of being white and feel like they are inherently bad, solely for the color of their skin. By forcing our children to view each other through the lens of this kind of instruction, we do not make life easier for them or lighten their load. 
We are instead forcing complex, unrefined, and unbalanced ways of thinking on young developing minds. This hurts all of our children and creates in them the division we see in adults all around us. We have to do better. Thank you. Jennifer Cooper, Dave Salink, Indakuri Raju, Kevin Peacher, Sarah King. Ooh, nervous. Jennifer Cooper. I have questions regarding what appears to be racial and identity profiling in our schools, and it seems to be sanctioned by this board and by the union. I was looking around at the CCSD website and found some interesting things that I don't really hear anything about. I saw that CCSD has an Office of Inclusive Excellence. Among other culturally responsive things, this office has a goal of making sure they hire, quote unquote, hire and retain teachers and administrators of color in an effort to ensure diversity in the workplace. And I'm thinking, well, shouldn't we already be doing that? I also noted that the executive director doesn't seem to have a school bio or a history or even a LinkedIn profile that I could find because I wanted to know what her qualifications were. How does one get to be a director of Office of Inclusive Excellence? I also noticed that this office is under the equity, culture and community engagement section. There are 11 directors and partners for different groups. So when we raise our taxes by voting for new amendments that seem to be happening every single election cycle, I wonder how much of our tax dollars are going to the departments like the equity department. And then I wonder how much of these administrators are actually getting paid. I heard rumors that although the schools raise a lot of money via taxes, it seems to go just to the administrators and not the teachers. Just wondering about all that because it doesn't seem right. We pay a lot of taxes and the teachers are getting they're getting screwed, but thank you. Once again, we are pleading with the district to return to the to its dedication to excellent offerings, a rich oris, non-political, and equal academics, e education for all students. We encourage the parents and community members to join in the Cherry Creek Parents Advocacy Network and at cherrycreekparents.org to stay aware of what is happening in our schools. Our hope is that the Cherry Creek School District leadership honors teachers, parents, and our children by begin, being transparent with curriculum and ac accountable for their failures. The district practice of ignorance parental concerns must end. We trust that through increases awareness, our community will demand accountability so that all children will have a safe and fulfilling educational experience. Hello, uh, my name is Indukuri Raju. I have uh, one in high school city, twins in uh, middle school. Um, we thank a lot of teachers. Um, where I come from, where I went to school, there wasn't a day I wanted to go to school. And my kids, there wasn't a single day that they don't want to go to school. That's all because of the teachers. Having said, um, I'm going to stick with my... This is about uh, the elimination of valedictorian. When my son attended one of the, my friend's daughter's graduation some time ago, who was a valedictorian that year, his, he curiously inquired and it stuck in his head ever since. And valedictorian is something like reaching for the stars in academic sense at high school. If you aim for it, at least you can reach moon or Mars. And the efforts won't go wasted at all, right? In addition to removing this honor, the district had moved towards a policy of equality, equity in grading and leveling down and academic standards, eliminating the requirements of grading for homework 
um, advanced, eliminate, discussed about eliminating AP and IB programs. Really. And uh, by the way, um, the whole reason of bringing my kids is I want them to see the people, main people who voted for elimination of that academic achievement. Please take a look at this. Yeah. These, are, these, are the, these are the very people. They want you to dumb down to burger flippers. Howdy. I didn't come with a prepared statement. That guy right there stole all my thunder. Um, um, I, I think if you, uh, well, first off, Miss Garland, a great question about holding people back uh, when they don't uh, when they don't reach uh, levels one grade kindergarten through third grade. Um, and the response was that there's are studies that um, prove that to be detrimental, holding them back. I can tell you that it's detrimental to go through sixth to twelfth grade and not being able to read more so than right. holding someone back. Um, and as as far as uh, uh, valedictorian and all the standards that this gentleman just eloquated, um, if you want to continue down there, down the road that you're going on, you might want to change the letterhead from dedication to excellence to dedication to mediocrity. Thank you. At the 70th Annual Academy Awards, Goodwill Hunting received nine nominations. The young actors Affleck and Damon won the award for Best Original Screenplay. Damon grew up next door to a man named Howard Zinn. Zinn was a manifest communist and wrote a book called The People's History of the United States, which was featured prominently in the movie. When the genius character in the film, Will Hunty, reveals that this is the true history of the U.S., it turned an entire generation against America, but it is all a twisted lie. If any professor wrote what Zinn wrote about Christopher Columbus, they would be exiled from their profession. No serious person would be allowed to misrepresent Columbus, but the communist Zinn was allowed. We are told that the country that unites us is so fundamentally flawed that it must be completely overturned. This is the communist way. It is not the American way. In the first First Amendment, we have freedom of speech, freedom of religion, and freedom to own property. We can say that black people found worse conditions up north than Jim Crow laws during the Great Migration. We can say that in LA and the 90s, Latino gangs murdered black people for being black. We can say that my great-great-grandfather was an Irish immigrant who was worth less than a slave and sacrificed as worthless to build the new Basin Canal in New Orleans. We can say that Kyle Rittenhouse is an American hero because he is. We can say that a land acknowledgement is a counterproductive, destructive, pointless waste of time. We will no more return the lands taken in the late 1800s to indigenous peoples than we will return the lands to the white residents of West Virginia during the development of the coal mines in 1912. We cannot have two Independence Days, Juneteenth and the 4th of July. We cannot have Columbus Day and Indigenous Peoples Day. We are one country or we are not. God bless these United States and happy Columbus Day. Teresa Major, Teresa Major, and Sook Sucker, Brian McKinney. Hi, I'm Teresa Major, um, mother of 12. My, my autistic child is a freshman at Cherry Creek High School this year, and he loves it there. It's wonderful. I'm also the valedictorian class of 83 at my high school, so keep it keep it going. Um, but I'm way out of step with the current culture, but I'll just jump in. Um, since schools are such a powerful force for shaping the culture, I would beg you not to just be non-political, but to be non-sexual in the schools, because it's too much. And autistic kids are more at risk of being molested than the regular kid. And and we have we have become as a culture so obsessed with sex, we do not understand it anymore. I asked the principal of my my child's school last year. I said, "What what are the reproductive organs for?" 
And she wouldn't answer that question. She said, I can't answer that. I said, well, a biology teacher could answer it. The reproductive organs are for reproducing. And we should teach the basics. If you want to reproduce, use your reproductive organs. And, if, and it's best if, for the child if you're married and committed to each other. And if you don't want to reproduce, don't use them. You won't die. It solves a lot of problems. And kids need discipline. They need discipline to, to succeed in school. They need sexual discipline to succeed in their marriage, to succeed in life, to be a good mother and a good father, to be a successful person. We need to teach that now. Instead, we teach anything goes, whatever you feel like with your sexuality, gosh. And you know what? Teach the kids that, but you have to turn around and hire them as your teachers later. And then I get calls from the principal saying, you're kids para was just arrested for soliciting nude photos for minors and she killed herself the minor and the, then that guy is the is the softball coach of the girls thank you your time is up i want to start by acknowledging indigenous people's day the very peoples whose land we stand on the people who have been on the receiving end of genocide and attempted erasure and yet they persevere and are here strong. I too am here to speak for those who are silenced, bullied and pushed to the wayside. We've heard from folks to claim no politics and yet associate and post in white supremacist militia groups like FEC United for their Cherry Creek Parent Advocacy Network. Many of us have not and will not forget last summer's discussing and intimidation tactics of FEC United and their affiliated militia, AUAD. A UADF. Now these same people sit and advocate for the silence of BIPOC and LGBTQIA students. They resort to tactics like posting photos and recordings of equity advocates without their knowledge or their consent. If I, as an adult, am receiving photos from across the room of people taking pictures of me, the same people who are associated with the militia without my consent. How on earth is my son and other children possibly going to feel safe, secure, or trust the adults around them? When my son's principal makes a mockery of MAGA hats during the exact time he and I are being spit on, yelled at, and harassed, blamed for COVID, my son broke down and said he had lost the trust he had worked hard to build with the adults in his school. How as a parent do I ask him then to show up and do his best work in reading, writing, and math as if his very dignity and humanity doesn't matter? I can't and I won't. I implore the board and the district leadership to take a stand, the strongest stance against the white supremacy that's being flaunted at every meeting. Thank you. Good evening. Today was a was a good day. This evening, I'm shooting basketball with my my daughters. We're talking about their day. Um, they're actually making some shots. So I'm thinking, do I really want to come to a board meeting? Do I really want to come tonight? And then I realize it's important. They are why I'm here tonight. Now, what I'd like to do is continue speaking about my experience as a parent advocate in this district because I think it's constructive when we talk about family engagement or the lack thereof. At the last board meeting, as I finished talking about what I've encountered as a black father advocating for underserved children in this district, the leader who I found was the, the executive director of this Cherry Creek Parent Advocacy, Advocacy Network approached me, aggressively blocked my way to my seat, pushing papers into my face, getting into my face, and, and just take a pause. I want to thank security for stepping in and being quick as, as, as effective as you were. This organization, the Cherry Creek Parent Advocacy Network, has my picture in about five different places on their website. They don't even have their own pictures on this website, and yet they come to you all talking about transparency. Do as I say, not as I do. Now, what about me? What about me? What about my face? makes it so important for me to be on their website. What is, what is it? I think, I think we all know. I think we all know why my face needs to be so prominent on their site. But I'll let you all, I'll let you all think, think through that. Because you're black. Exactly. What type of hate, divisiveness, and racism, and ultimately violence Excuse me, Mr. McKinney. Mr. McKinney, can we please keep the comments down in the audience? We asked everyone to be respectful when others are speaking. Thank Are they you. trying to elicit 
out of control community members are a danger to us all. It's reckless, it's irresponsible, and everyone associated with this group, the Cherry Creek Parent Advocacy Network, should be ashamed of themselves. I'm not ceding ground, I'm not going any, anywhere, I'm gonna to continue to advocate for underserved students in this district. President Bates, that's all for tonight. Thank you. At this time, we need, we will be getting to look at our consent agenda. Before we move on to the cons consideration of the resolutions, are there any resolutions board members would like to pull or discuss? If not, then may I have a motion to approve the consent agenda resolution 20. 22.10.1 through 22.10.11. I move to approve the consent agenda, agenda resolution number 22.10.1 through number 22.10.11. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Is there any discussion? Thank you. Roll call, please. Directors Allen. Aye. Bates. Aye. Egan, aye. Garland, aye. McDonald, aye. Thank you. That motion is approved, and the consent agenda carries. The only other business remaining is to announce our next regular Board of Education meeting, Monday, November 14th, 2022, starting at 7 p.m., to be held in person at Overland High School, 12,400 East Jewel Avenue, Aurora, Colorado, 80012. Please remember the best way to stay informed with actual facts is to attend meetings at your local schools and these board meetings. Please keep yourself and your loved ones safe. Remember fall break starts on Friday, October the 14th. I hope all of our educators and families are able to enjoy a break from school and to make time to spend with family and friends. We hope to see you all in person next month. May I have a motion to adjourn this meeting, please? So moved. Thank you. May I have a second? A second. Roll call, please. Directors Allen. Aye. Bates. Aye. Egan. Aye. Garland. Aye. McDonald. Aye. The motion passed and this meeting is adjourned.